Okay, the first thing I want to go over is coming up with rules in your house and making those rules black and white. Uh, problems arise when we create gray areas. I'm going to tell you what my rules are. You can still my rules. You can come up with your own rules. Just make them black and white. So rule number one in my household is no teeth on family members. My old protection dog, Hurricane, he was a $35,000 dog and he was trained to rip off body parts. He was three times my daughter's size when I got him. There could be no gray area. I didn't want to end up on the news because my daughter's missing an arm because I created a gray area. But that means black and white in my house. It means no mouthing, no play biting, no nipping, no real biting. The rule is you don't put your teeth on family members. Rule number two, uh, we call it full on the floor. I've got two feet. My feet stay on the floor. Your dog has four feet. Their feet stay on the floor. I don't walk around putting my feet on guests. You don't walk around putting your feet on guests. But that means black and white in my household. That means no jumping, no counter surfing, uh, no bed, no couch. I stick to that rule so strictly that I train my Wamaraner uh, for the actress Queen Latifah. And she put about $15,000 worth of training into him. I use him for search and rescue demonstrations now. I take him to local schools. I will demo all of his commands and we'll do a little meet and greet afterwards. And the kids will come up to Cash and they'll go, great job, Cash, shake. And he'll just stare at him. And the kids will look at me and they go, you don't know how to teach your dog shake? I taught my dog shake. In my mind, I go, I just did like 70 commands and shake is the easiest command to teach. I go, I could teach him shake in 10 seconds, but it wouldn't be fair to Cash to go, Cash, put your paws on little kids and I'm gonna reward you for that. And then turn around and get mad at him when he puts his paws on little kids. So I don't teach shake. I don't teach sit pretty. Anything that has to do with your paws off of the ground, I don't teach. Then my third rule is that all of my pack members have to get along. This goes for the dogs, the cat, the chickens, the ducks, the pigs, the horses. We are a nice peaceful pack. We all have to get along. So those are my rules. Uh, whatever your rules are, just make them black and white. The next thing we're gonna go over is your daily schedule. I'm gonna give you two schedules. One schedule is kind of your worst case scenario where um, you're gone for the day, you cannot be home, you can't have your eyes on your dog. And then after we get through that, I'm gonna backtrack and we're gonna go over what I call the weekend routine. The weekend routine is anytime somebody is home. This can be weekends, holidays, people that work from home, stay at home moms or dads, people that are retired. Um, he will have a different schedule if you guys are home than if you guys are gone for the day, okay? So the first thing we're gonna go over, um, for one, as a puppy, they should be sleeping in a, in a plastic crate. So here we've got when you're waking up, 6 a.m. for you, and these times are alterable. If it's not six for you, uh, just adjust accordingly. But when you get up, let them out to potty, and then it says back in the crate while you get ready for your day. The reason I put back in the crate while you get ready for your day is because I don't want you getting ready for your day, and then your dog is sneaking into the other room that chewing, that's, uh, chewing on a cord that's plugged into a wall. So if you cannot have your eyes on them, just put them in a kennel until you can have your eyes on them. So back in the crate while you get ready for your day. Before you leave, and here we have you leaving at 8 a.m. So I've got at 7 a.m. This is gonna be your first training session. Let them out to potty, train for 10 to 15 minutes, and then some type of formal exercise. Formal meaning a brisk walk, a quick run, some time on the treadmill. This is not stick in the backyard by themselves. It is formal exercise. Once you're done with that, put them back in the crate and then head out for work. If somebody can get home at lunchtime, it says let them out to potty and if possible, a short five minute training session. The reason I put if possible, I don't expect people that have to drive to work to drive home on their lunch break, eat lunch, let their dog out to go to the bathroom, also train and exercise their dog and then drive back on their one hour lunch break. If you have the time, great, knock out a short five minute training session. If you don't have the time, don't worry about it. You're gonna do another training session once you get home for the day. Okay, so now this brings us to the, the end of your work day. Here we've got 4 p.m. This is your last training session. Let them out to potty, 10 to 15 minutes of training, and then some type of formal exercise again. So just like we did in the morning before work, you're gonna do the same thing after work. Um, so basically what I'm asking for you is 10 to 15 minutes of training in the morning, pair that with some exercise, and then 10 to 15 minutes of training in the evening, and then pair that with some exercise. After your training session, this gets us to about dinner time. For us, with this schedule, it says 6 p.m. Notice here, we feed in the crate. So open the crate, the dog goes in the crate, close the crate, then you go eat dinner. Feeding him in the crate will do a number of things. It will put a positive association on his kennel. It'll keep him out of your hair while you're trying to eat dinner. 
But the most important reason here is because of torsion. So torsion is when dogs have food and water in their belly and they go bouncing around and jumping around. Their stomach can get weighted and twist, which is called torsion, which causes gastro bloat, which is fatal. Let's say it's rained a lot in the last couple weeks. You haven't got to exercise much. Um, you feed them on the kitchen floor and they suddenly get the zoomies and they're running laps around your living room. You run that risk of their stomach flipping and it killing them. There is no risk of torsion um, when we feed them in the kennel. The pups eat once a day, end of the day, when you're eating dinner is when they should eat dinner. Once you're finished with dinner, uh, we've got a half hour minimum in their kennel. You're gonna let them out to potty. They should empty themselves here, meaning they should pee and poop before you let them back in. Once they've peed and pooped, then they can have supervised free time until bedtime. Supervised meaning that you have your eyes on them. If they get out of sight, just call them back into sight. And then um, that's gonna take you to bedtime. Here we've got 9.30, 9.30, just one more potty break before bedtime, and then they sleep in their kennel. This is if you were busy for the day. If somebody is home, I don't expect them to be in the crate from 7 to 12, then 12 to 4. They can be out and about. So here we've got the weekend routine. If somebody is home from 8 to 9, they can have free time. That's just hanging out with you, being a dog. But after an hour of that free time, put them back in their kennel, let them rest a little bit. This will let them recharge. You can get some things done around the house. You're not constantly have to have your eyes on them. After an hour of resting in the crate, they get another hour of free time. So from 10 to 11, um, supervised free time. After an hour of that, 11 to 12, let them rest in the crate again. Okay, this will take you to your lunch. After lunch, you're gonna do the same thing. You're basically rotating hour of free time to an hour in the kennel. Now the end goal for every dog should be that you've earned free reign of the house 24 seven. Meaning no matter what, Nobody's there, you, can, you don't have to have your eyes on them, but they've got free reign 24 seven. I have two requirements for that. Requirement number one is you need to be through your adolescence. Adolescence for female dogs tends to be about two to two and a half. Adolescence for male dogs tends to be about two and a half to three. So keep that number in mind before we look at giving them free reign. The other requirement for having free reign of the house is you gotta play by my rules. Whatever my rules are, if you are playing by my rules and you're through your adolescence, I will give you free reign of the house. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna go over is items that you need for training. The first thing you're gonna need is reinforcement. This is your dog's currency. It's what your dog likes. In the human world, we have the five love languages. Dogs have three love languages. It's treats, praise, toys. And 99.9% .9 of dogs are gonna be one of those three or a combination of those three. For us in our boot camp. Um, this is subjective. What is reinforcing for one dog may not be reinforcing for another dog. My old protection dog, Hurricane, that dog would do anything on the planet for chicken hot dogs. Gave him but just a little piece Everything he did was for his ball. ball. I would but do this trick find every time dog I realize something. I put his ball this, in one hand and put a steak in the other hand. Okay. And I go, Hurricane, you pick. And he took the ball every single time. Once I had a $38 filet mignon, I'm like, please don't be the one time you take the steak. But he took the ball. That's what's valuable for him. Not only is it subjective, it is also up to the dog. We had a client once go, uh, I'll pick praise. And I said, it's not up to you. And he goes, but what if I make the praise better? I said, it's still not up to you. And he goes, but what if I make it awesome anytime he does something I want him to do? And I said, okay, your love language is receiving gifts and it's your birthday. And your wife's love language is giving affection. And you get up and you, your wife goes, hey, today I thought that we would just snuggle. And you go, but you saw the date, right? You know it's my birthday. And she goes, yeah, so we're gonna snuggle more today. And you go, yeah, I was expecting a nice gift. And she goes, yeah, we're gonna snuggle all day. That's the gift. And you go, why are you listening to me, right? So same thing here, um, it is up to the dog. So find something that your dog likes and then do whatever is the most effective. For our boot camp here, we use chicken hot dogs. The next thing you're gonna need for training is a way to mark behavior. We've classically conditioned your pup that this click means good job, a reward is on its way. The reason we use the clicker, dogs have a, a very short window of association. It's about 1.3 seconds. That means you have 1.3 seconds to get them a reward before they no longer associate the reward for the behavior. And I don't care how many times you practice, it's tough to get there in 1.3 seconds. This clicker, when we mark that behavior, will act like a bridge and it will buy you four to five more seconds. So you don't have to be fast with the treat, um, you just have to be fast with the click. Now, some people like the clicker, some people don't. So on the front end, we've also conditioned your dog to yes. So yes also means good job or reward is on its way. You can use either one. 
The next thing we're going to use is a treat pouch. The next item you're going to need for training is a long leash. This is a long, flat leash, not a retractable leash, um, but a long, flat leash like this. This is a great safety net for you. If you're out in public and you want to do some this of your long distance store your hot dogs, and it's not safe you, from hot dogs you can use a long machine. leash and this will give exactly. you more control. The last thing you need for training is a great attitude. Training your dog should be fun. If you're not having fun, take a step back and go, hey, what am I doing wrong here? Um, this should be fun and then call us and we'll get you back on track. But your dog's energy will mirror your energy. So if you get up in the morning and you go, oh, I don't want to be out here, it's early, it's cold, your dog's gonna go, I don't wanna be out here either, right? So if you're peppy and energetic, your dog will be peppy and energetic. So have fun with your dog. The next thing we wanna go over is what we call biological fulfillment. This is giving your dog what they biologically need to be happy and healthy. As a human, if you wanna give yourself the best chance to succeed in life, you take care of your body, take care of your mind, sleep well and eat well. And if you do those four things, you're gonna be on the best path possible. Dogs are the same way. You gotta take care of their body, meaning they need daily formal exercise. And for me, this is the one of the four that is breed specific. If you have a Rhodesian Ridgeback, those dogs are used to hunt lions, and they do so through persistence hunting, meaning that they will chase a lion for 30 miles before that lion would rather die than run anymore. People go, what's the magic amount of exercise to keep my Ridgeback happy? And I go, I don't know, 30 miles? I don't know, go run a marathon, that dog will love that. And Ridgebacks often get a bad rap because they tend to be aggressive. And it's not the Ridgeback's fault. It's that you have a Ridgeback in an apartment and you've walked him around the block once a week for the past year. And in that breed, it comes out as aggression. Now, if you have a French Bulldog, that magic number is 30 feet. Walk him to the mailbox back, you're good for the day. So I do encourage you to uh, do your breed research and figure out um, what type of exercise your dog needs. The next thing is you have to take care of their mind. They need daily mental stimulation. They need a job. If you don't give them a job, they will create their own job. And you don't want your dog to be self-employed. Self-employed dogs wreak havoc. They dig in the backyard, they guard the fence, they herd the kids. Leaving here with our boot camp, uh, that mental stimulation, that job should be obedience or agility training with you. But I do encourage you to build on that. I have every one of my dogs do nose work or scent work. And if you get to that point where you're wanting to teach your dog something new, just call us and we'll give you some homework to do. Your dog also needs to sleep well. Dogs are din animals. In the wild, they burrow dens. So if your pup were in the wild, it would dig a hole big enough for it to fit in. It would crawl into that hole, turn around and put his teeth right at the entrance. There's one way in and one way out. So if a predator comes up, they're protected on all sides. We recommend that your dog sleeps in a plastic crate or a plastic kennel, not a wire cage. These plastic crates mimic a den in the wild. If your dog didn't have a den, it couldn't create a den, it was in a field somewhere, it would close its eyes, but it would be on high alert all night long. It would do this. What was that? All night long. Now imagine if you slept like that for a night or two. How much stress or anxiety would you have? Now imagine if it's been a year of sleeping like that. And that uh, adequate rest is something that as humans we overlook. Um, and the reason we overlook that is because we don't have predators. But do you know why we don't have predators? Some people say that we're top of the food chain. And I go, okay, go sleep in the woods for a week. Tell me how you feel. Well, you will not feel like you're top of the food chain. Some people go, well, we have guns. Uh, and I go, okay, go sleep in the woods with your gun. Are you gonna go into deep rapid eye movement and sleep? I can tell you this firsthand, but the reason we don't have predators is because we are den animals too. At night we go into our den, which is our house, and we close our door behind us and we lock it. Then and only then do we go into deep rapid eye movement and sleep. So use a plastic crate. The last thing we wanna go over with biological fulfillment is a healthy diet. There are two things you wanna look for for your dog food. One, uh, over 30% protein. If your dog is young and growing, it needs to be over 30% protein. The other thing you wanna look for is read the ingredients and read all of them from the first ingredient to the last. What you don't want in your dog's food is byproduct. So you can have a meat source, call it chicken. You can have chicken, chicken meal, chicken byproduct. Chicken would be if they take that chicken, they cut the uh, choice cuts of meat off of there, that's chicken. You would recognize it if you saw it on a table. And what you have after that is the frame of the chicken, which is bones, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, and then what's called the viscera, which is the abdominal organs. If you remove that viscera, you take the frame of the chicken, they take that, they grind it up, they make it into a paste. That paste is called chicken meal. 
A meal is just okay as a secondary source of protein. You don't want it as your primary source of protein. Now what you have after that is the viscera, the abdominal organs. Now they remove the good ones, like the liver, the kidneys, the heart. They sell this to other places. That leaves you the filtering organs. This is the bladder, the spleen, the intestines. They take that, they grind that up, they make that into a paste. That paste is called chicken byproduct. You don't want byproduct in your food. You also don't want starchy grains. Corn, wheat, rice, millet, dried beet pulp. These are things that dogs have not eaten for thousands of years. So no byproduct, no starchy grains. Okay, the process that animals learn, that process is called operant conditioning. And it doesn't matter if it's dogs, cats, pigeons, whales, humans, we all learn through the same process um, called operant conditioning. The problem with operant conditioning is the terminology. In the psychology world, positive doesn't mean good, negative doesn't mean bad. Positive means adding, negative means taking away. So you can have positive reinforcement, you can also have positive punishment, and you can have negative reinforcement, and you can have negative punishment. And those terms can get really confusing. Basically what operant conditioning says is every behavior has a consequence, and that consequence will shape that behavior in the future. So I like to use a very simple equation, um, A plus B equals C. A is a behavior, B is a consequence for that behavior, and then C is my desired result. A, behavior, that's the easy part. Sit, your dog's butt hits the ground, that's the behavior. Now it's gonna be followed by something, it can be something good, which we call reinforcement, or it can be something bad, which we call punishment. And then C is my desired result. The reason I put my desired result and not your dog's desired result, because in a human dog relationship, we should be in control of the consequences. So we've talked about reinforcement already. That's your dog's currency. That's what your dog likes. Uh, now this needs to be valuable enough that if it follows a behavior, they'll be more likely to repeat that behavior. Now the flip side of that is called punishment. Now people tend to cringe when you say the word punishment. They think that it means it hurts the animal or that it's painful. Um, so there are some things that um, I would like to make clear about punishment. One, it doesn't mean painful. Um, it can be painful, but it doesn't have to be painful. Nowhere in the definition of the word punishment is the word pain. It is a penalty or an imposition for an action. Now that penalty or an imposition at least needs to be aversive or unpleasant. Uh, it can't be pleasant or that would be reinforcement, but it doesn't have to be painful. Also, punishment doesn't change behavior. Punishment doesn't do anything for long-term learning. It does for short-term learning, which we call suppress. So knowing that, I cannot use punishment as a teaching tool. I can use it as a suppressing tool or an interrupting tool, but not as a teaching tool. You know, I get this debate with parents all the time. And you go, I've never spanked my daughter. And people go, really, never? And they go, no, there's no point. And they go, what do you mean there's no point? I go, okay, if my daughter were reaching for a hot stove, I might slap her hand out of the way and go, sweetie, the reason I did that because that thing is hot. And if you're gonna touch it, it's gonna burn you. You're gonna get blisters, have to go to the hospital and get a shot. You hate shots, right? Don't touch that thing. But if she had painted the carpet with lipstick three hours prior, I don't go in there and beat her for it later. There's nothing to suppress anymore. Um, and then the last thing here is, just like reinforcement, punishment is subjective as well. What is punishment for one dog may not be punishment for another dog. I'm gonna give you some examples of what punishment could be, and then I'll show you what we use in our training here. Okay, punishment could be like my Great Dane Marley. He's about 160 pounds, he's got this big loud bark on him. Um, but he's the biggest baby on the planet. All I need to do to suppress Marley's behavior is change my tone. If I go, Marley, I go, okay, I won't do that ever again. I'm so sorry. And he will stop doing what he's doing. That's punishment for Marley. It could be what we call sound aversion. This is giving a sharp, sudden sound like, eh, or shh, or clap your hands, stomp your feet, something sudden that startles them, and they stop doing what they're doing. It could be a spray with a water bottle. It could be a pop with a newspaper. I had a client once say that she used a can with rocks and coins in it. She goes, one of my dogs is terrified of it. She goes, if I put that thing on the kitchen floor, it won't come in the kitchen. She goes, my other dog picks it up and plays with it. I said, right, subjective, right? It's effective for the one dog, but not for the other dog. Now, I don't encourage you to do this, but you can use pain to suppress behavior. You could go and purchase a choke chain. You can put this around your dog's neck and ask him to sit. And if they don't, you can start restricting their air. And at some point, they're gonna panic and put their butt on the ground, right? Or pass out one of the two, right? Or, like most dog trainers, you can use a pinch collar or a prong collar with these metal prongs on it. You can put this around your dog's neck. 
And if they jump up on somebody, you can pop that pinch collar really hard and those prongs are gonna drive into their neck and they're gonna stop jumping for the moment. Or, for the trainers that don't use these, everybody else uses one of these. This is an e-collar, electric collar, shock collar, training collar, whatever you wanna call it, they'll have one thing in common. And it's these two electric prods right here. You can put this around your dog's neck and if they jump up on the couch, you can send a bolt of electricity through their neck and they're going to jump off of the couch. Now, they might develop PTSD from getting electrocuted, they might pee and poop on your couch, but they'll be off of the couch, right? Mission accomplished, right? But you don't have to use these things, and I don't encourage you to. But if you're not gonna use pain, you have to use precision, which is timing. In our training, if this is your dog's normal leash and collar, this is all you need. It's a tap on the shoulder. Now, you have to time this tap on the shoulder correctly, if you don't time it correctly, it will be ineffective. I'm going to teach you a technique how to time it correctly. That technique is called planned failure. And it doesn't matter what the bad behavior is, you're gonna use the same technique. I call it planned failure for two reasons. Reason number one, you're gonna plan on the situation ahead of time so you can get repetitions. Your dog is never gonna learn from one rep. And if you wait for life to happen, it's often hard um, to get multiple reps. Let's say that your dog jumps on people at the door, and you wait for that random UPS guy to come to the door, and your pup jumps all over him. You're not gonna ask the UPS guy, hey, could you turn around and come and do that again? I gotta get my reps in. He's gonna go, no, your dog is crazy, and I have to work. But if you have friends, family members, neighbors, you can call them ahead of time, plan on it ahead of time, and say, hey, look, I'm working on my dog not jumping at the door. Can I borrow you today? Listen, I just need you for two minutes, but in that two minutes, I need to get five to 10 reps in. If it's gonna take your dog 50 reps to understand don't jump on people at the door, and you wait for that random UPS guy to come once a week, it's gonna take you a whole year to reach 50 reps. But if you can take two minutes out of your day and get five to 10 reps, it's gonna take you one week to reach 50 reps. So plan on the situation ahead of time. Uh, the second reason we call it planned failure is we're gonna plan on your dog to fail. In order for us to work on a behavior, that behavior has to be present. Clients will come to us all the time and they'll say, uh, my dog is uh, kid aggressive. Can you please work on that? And I'll go, well, I could, but what that's going to entail is I gotta get my cute little daughter out here with her pigtails and put it in front of your dog who likes to bite little kids. And when I jokingly say that, I get one of two reactions. The most common reaction, people go, okay, that sounds good, sign us up, when do we start? And I look at him and I go, did you hear what I said? I know I talk fast, but did you understand what I was saying there? I'm not gonna risk my daughter, sorry. The other reaction, people go, don't do that. Is there no other way to do that? And I go, there is another way. You can bring your kid here, we'll put him in front of your dog who likes to bite little kids. But if you don't bring your kid and I don't bring my kid, that means I have to hit the streets and go looking for kids for your dog to bite. And I would definitely get arrested for that, right? So that behavior has to be present. The next thing we wanna go over is what's called generalization decrement. This is a, a weakening and condition responding when we change something in your dog's environment. This can be as simple as changing uh, the type of flooring, changing the color of the walls, changing handlers, changing schedule. Any one of those things can cause a dip in production, which we call generalization decrement. That first week when you get your dog home, your dog is graduating high school. You'll need to scale it down to elementary school the first week. There will be a dip in production. So if you've been doing a 100 foot long sit, don't try that week one. Instead of getting 100 foot sit, trying over and over again and failing, do 25 foot sits. So get lots and lots of little victories um, that first week. Not only will you see that that first week, but there's a really good chance that we're gonna see that dipping production at graduation. And people go, well, what's different today? You, you're here, right? They haven't seen you in weeks. They're gonna get a dip in production. For some dogs, it can be 30 seconds. For some dogs, it can be hours. Um, but expect that dip in production. Okay, if you ask any dog trainer on the planet how to fix jumping, you'll get two answers, uh, or three if it's an e-collar trainer. We're also I'm including a list of commands. Answer number one is, well, if the dog jumps up, three week just uh, stick your knee up and knee the dog. Or, the very last let's say if your dog jumps up, just turn around for, uh, and face the wall or act like a tree. But those, those techniques never work. Because the focus on those techniques 
Um, it's not on reinforcement, it's on punishment. And imagine, you know, for those dog trainers, I go, uh, that's not teaching. Imagine if we taught our kids that way. Imagine if my daughter went up to her second grade teacher. She goes, here you go, Ms. Davis, here's my homework. And Ms. Davis goes, wrong, bam, and the knees are in the chest. How much learning would take place there? Like none, right? Or here you go, Ms. Davis, here's my homework. And Ms. Davis just turns and stares at the wall. Or my favorite is, you know, before my daughter heads off to school, I put her little e-collar on her and go, good luck, kiddo. And then she walks up to her, Miss Davis, and she's like, here you go, Miss Davis. And Miss Davis goes, wrong, and electrocute her. What's going to happen in those scenarios is my daughter's going to go from making straight A's to skipping school because she doesn't want to get beat in the chest or electrocuted or she's not learning because the teacher's just facing the wall. The focus on those techniques is uh, based on punishment and not reinforcement. And learning takes place through reinforcement. Here's a very common mistake that people make. They go through some formal training like this and they stick to it till that dog hits about one years old. They look at them and they physically look full grown, but at a year old, your dog is mentally gonna be like a seven year old. That's like a second grader. So by getting rid of their structure and just giving your dog free reign at a year old would be like going up to your second grade child and going, listen, you're doing great. I saw your report card, you're making straight A's. Here's your own apartment. And then going, I don't know why he filled high school. He was making straight A's before. But I can tell you why, it's just too soon. You know, with humans, there's a time and a place for that. It's called college. And for your dog, that time is for females two to two and a half years old, for males, two and a half to three years old. 